All right. Good morning. Welcome to the Feast Church, everybody. Make your way on in. Go ahead and grab a seat. Uh, you are the true hearty ones. It is uh, spring forward morning, and here you are. You are on time. Many of you early had some coffee. In all seriousness, uh, we were just talking. Somebody was saying sort of how they feel a little discombobulated today, right? Like, I know everything I did this morning was about 15, 20 minutes slower, right, than what we usually do. And I guess what I would just tell you is you are here now. If you're with us online, you're with us online now. And you might have had a slow start to your morning. You might have been grumpy about having to get up the way you had to get up and all of those kinds of things. <laughs> um, that's okay because now you're here. I know I have a tendency when I get frustrated to then rehearse all those other things that have happened all day long. You don't need to do that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about your wake up. Don't worry about the time. Don't worry about whether the government has not changed this daylight savings time thing. That Like, <laughs> let it all go away. You are here and just feel rested and settled in this place. And uh, I think that's a good place to start to come to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. God, um... We thank you for new days and new mornings. Uh, I am enough of not an early riser. I appreciated seeing the sun at a different angle than I usually see it this morning. And so <laughs> we thank you for your good blessings, God. Uh, help us to come whatever our morning was like and to experience your love and kindness and patience and comfort in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. So now that you're here and awake, you can probably stand with us as we worship together. <clears throat> Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh, yes, you are good, good. Oh, yes, you are good, good. Oh, yes, you are good. king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of the days oh he's my song you are good good Oh, yes, you are good, good. Oh, yes, you are good, good. Oh, yes, you are good, good. Oh, you're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are good, good. Oh, yes, you are good, good. Oh, yes, you are good. Good, good, oh. <clears throat> Grace, what have you done? Murdered 
that cross, accused in absence of wrong, my sin washed away in your blood, too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my fall. The scandal of grace, you died in my place, so oh, my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. Death, where is your sting? Your power is as dead as my sin. The cross has taught me to live. In mercy my heart now to sing. The day and its trouble shall come. I know that your strength is enough. The scandal of grace, you died in my place, so my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you. And give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. And it's all because of you, Jesus. It's all because of you, Jesus. It's all because of your love that my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you. Give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Um, so this week, I've really been thinking a lot about journeys. And um, with Easter coming in a few weeks, starting to think about Jesus's journey to Jerusalem and how he now knows he's headed to Jerusalem to die. And he's trying to like prepare his disciples and they don't understand. Um, and so there's been so many things going through my head about what it means to be on a journey um, and how in different points of your journey like you feel like you're climbing a mountain or you're in a valley or you're just like on a plateau um, how there are times you look around and you get jealous of why is someone else further ahead on the journey than me why do they get to take that journey and why am I on this journey and I just Imagine that the cross and the communion is a place to come and say, this is where I am on my journey. And Jesus, just help me get 
on, you know, to your journey. Help me be at the cross with you and at your resurrection and help me to know that, like, that this is where I'm to be. Um, and as Easter is coming, you know, people talk about Palm Sunday and all this different stuff to focus on Jesus. But I think it's something we do every Sunday when we come to communion of, like, where are we on our journey, especially our journey with Christ? You know, are we in a valley? Are we on a mountain peak? Are we on a plateau? Have we stalled out? Have we just hit a wall and we're just like, oh, there's a wall. Like, you might find someone to help you along the journey or you might be by yourself. But communion is the place to examine that every week and to ask God to say, where am I on this journey and where do you want me to go this next week? Um, so just pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for time every week to come to the table to examine where we are on our journey with you, where you're leading us this week. Um, we just ask that you, you allow us to see the progress that it may be slow, it may only be a few steps, but that progress Good morning. Um, let's go ahead and stand. We have a new song, so it makes me feel a little bit on a similar <laughs> level. To, um, did want to read a section. This is to the prophet Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Very different circumstance than what you're going through today, um, but I think the message and the prayer is the same. Just whatever you're grieving this morning, um, just be reminded that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Take that and rest in that as we go through the, the rest of service today. I'm fighting a battle you've already won. No matter what comes my way, 
I will overcome. I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. I'm fighting a battle that you've already won. There's peace that outlasts darkness, hope that's in the blood. There's future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow, for tomorrow's in your hands. All I need you will provide just like you always have. I'm fighting a battle you've already won. No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. I don't know what you're doing. But I know what you've done. I'm fighting a battle that you've already won. There's mercy in the waiting, men for today. And when it's gone, I know you're not. You are my hope and stay. When the sea is raging, your spirit is my help. Will fix my eyes on Jesus Christ and say that it is well. I'm fighting the battle you've already won. No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. Don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. I'm fighting a battle that you've already won. I know how this story ends. We will be with you again. Uh, OK, I'm going to skip that part. <laughs> I'm fighting a battle. You've already won. No matter what comes my way, I have overcome. Don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. I'm fighting a battle that you've already won. We'll work on it. <laughs> okay. good. One more song for our uh, sermon time this morning. Hide me now. Under your wings, cover me within your mighty hand. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. Find rest, my soul, in Christ alone. Know his power in quietness and trust. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. 
When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. I will be still and know you are God. Take a seat. All right. Kiddos, it is that time for kids' class. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me. All right. Um, they say that a boiled pot or a washed pot does not boil. Uh, I don't know if you have had this experience when you're trying to cook, trying to make something, that the more you watch it, the worse it gets, right? It just takes forever. The other night, um, Fran had made something in the crock pot, and it was like, if you can, before dinner time, pull it out, pull the meat out of the crock pot, and then put the drippings, juicy stuff into a pan, put in a little cornstarch, and then stir until thick. I hate it when they say stir until thick. Well, how thick are we going for, right? You know, like, I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, it's more than water, but it's not exactly like, you know, sesame chicken Chinese goo, right? Like, we're not there yet. And I just... I sat there stirring all night, and I thought, I could stir this until Jesus comes back. And I'm not sure if it will ever be what it's supposed to be as thick, right? And I just, those sort of undefined processes that don't have an end point really bother me, particularly like in the kitchen. Uh, I like to cook shrimp. A uncooked shrimp looks very clearly uncooked, and a cooked shrimp looks very clearly cooked. Right? Like, they, it changes color, it changes shape, it goes from one thing to another. Uh, my wife may laugh at this. While I don't do it as much as I should, this is why, like, washing the dishes is the best chore, because you start with a dirty dish, and you end with a clean dish. Right? There's times where she's like, can you go straighten up the living room? And I'm like, I don't know what it looks like pre-straighten and post-straighten. Like, those are the same thing to me. Uh, that is not a process that I want to engage in. And the reality is we can be really frustrated with things that take a long time. We enjoy sprints a lot more than we enjoy metaphors. Um, sprints? Metaphors. It is a metaphor. We enjoy sprints mar more than we enjoy a marathon, right? Because we like to know, hey, I've gotten to the end. I've gotten there. Nobody likes to be in the middle. No one wants to pick up a kid to babysit, and they hear that they're 87% potty trained, right? That's not very helpful. I need 100%. When you start to get people into an academic program, two-year degrees sound a whole lot more interesting than four-year degrees. Because it's just this thing of watching the pot boil. When is it finally going to be done? When can I move on to the next step? Throughout our sermon series, we've been looking at the book of Acts, and we've been talking about how we can be beautifully disruptive. We said we all want the world to be different. We all want the world to be better. We want to change the world. But how do we do that? And particularly, how do we do that in a way that is winsome to the world? That uh, the world is happy to change, not where we club the world over the head and drag it into where we want it to be. And we've looked at all the different ways that the early church went about doing those changes. But the reality is that change takes time. And as much as I love the Bible and I love a book like Acts, there's one thing about it that's really difficult, and that is you can read the book of Acts in an afternoon. Depending on who you are, give it an hour or two, and you can go from the beginning of it to the end of it and read every story in there. And Luke has condensed for you decades of hard work, 
into something that can be read while you sip a cup of coffee. And that condensing of timelines sometimes gives us false expectations about how the world changes. Because the reality is none of the work that the early church did happened in an afternoon. It all happened over a really long period of time. And we're going to talk today a bit about one of those moments in Paul's life that probably took longer than he wanted. We're going to start our story today in Corinth. If you've been with us the last few weeks, we've been talking about Paul sort of on a world tour. And we talked about how he went to Philippi, and it was a big military community, and the Romans had repopulated, and we talked about what that place would have looked like. And last week, we talked about Athens and how Athens was kind of a, a college town, right? It was a town filled with learn, people with a lot of learning and a lot of education. They were always talking about new ideas. Uh, Corinth, I find to be a little bit harder of a place to explain. Uh, Corinth is also a Roman colony, so there's lots of Roman stuff. Um, the way we always know this, when we dig stuff out of the ground, it's all got Latin on it. So that shows us that the Romans were really strongly involved there. Corinth is also a resurrected city. So in other words, somewhere along the line, I think it was the Romans, came in and they burned it down. They said, no more city here. We don't want there to be a city. And then I think Julius Caesar was the one that came along and said, hey, I will make myself look awesome by bringing the city back to life. And so it was a city that went out of business, and within 100 years or so of when Paul gets there, had been reopened and built back up into a major city. It has a really important role, if you can tell from this map. Corinth is right there in the middle. It's kind of like uh, the Panama Canal. If you're trying to connect between the Aegean Sea and the other one that I don't have the name of, so I forget, and you want to get between those two places, it's a lot easier to go between, sort of on the left here, go between the two masses of land, and then you would literally just take your boat, land it, pull all your stuff off it, take it across land, and put it on another boat, and then go from there. That sounds a little crazy to us, but open seas were really dangerous for ancient people. And so going along the coast, and transferring at Corinth was the better financial way to go. Today, there is a canal there. They have dug out a canal so that boats can go through. Uh, you can bungee jump off that canal as well. I don't know why I thought about that, but you can. Anyways, um, and so that is the place it is. And so Corinth was an interesting town in that it was financially a really important place because there's a lot of business that went through there. Um, but it was also a little bit of kind of the Wild West. We know Corinth as sort of a morally ambiguous place. It's a place that is famous for being sort of sexually loose in their morals. The best I know to think of is if you watch a pirate movie, right? And they land at a port of call somewhere in the Caribbean and there's, there's rum and there's guys with beards and they're singing the pirate songs and they're chasing women. Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disney World, right? This is kind of the way to think of this place. A place where there was all sorts of sailors coming in, speaking like sailors, doing stuff sailors do, and there was money going around, and that's sort of the town. Uh, American examples I find hard. To me, I think of maybe a little bit like New Orleans, right? A very cosmopolitan place, all kinds of cultures, all kinds of weirdness going on, a lot of religious stuff and superstitious stuff, and things on the street that you don't see on the street everywhere else in the world, right? And that's the town that Paul is living in when he is in Corinth. And so I want to start, and we're going to read the beginning and the end of Paul's time to get sort of the bookends of what it's like, and then we'll get to the middle, and I have a reason for doing it that way. After this, Paul left Athens, where we were last week, and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, who was a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on you, uh, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. 
And then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, with his entire household, believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Now, fast forwarding a bit. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off, and then the crowd turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatever. Uh, Paul is constantly just dodging arrows in Corinth. Corinth is a mess. He is constantly in conflict there. He is dealing with these people, and he has a lot of conflict, particularly from his... Um, his Jewish brethren who have not believed in Jesus, they're frustrated he's there. He's frustrating the teaching Jesus. It's really helpful to remember, for us Christians, we read Acts, and a couple weeks ago we read Acts 15, right? And they said, hey, what are we going to do with the Gentiles? And they had a big powwow, they figured it out, and they said, yes, we're going to do this, right? This is how we're going to be about Gentiles. And so it's all solved. Like, they and their council figured out how locally they were going to deal with it. Just remember non-Christian Jewish people did not go, oh, you had a council and Gentiles are okay now. Great, we'll take your word on it, right? Like, those communities are still upset. And so even though the church is welcoming the Gentiles, the, the synagogues around the world are saying, like, this Paul guy is constantly hanging out with people he shouldn't be hanging out with. He's constantly breaking rules. He's not, you know, he's eating with people. They're eating stuff they're not supposed to. My guess is Paul's eating that stuff too. Like there's just all sorts of stuff going on that you're not supposed to do. And they're mad. And so there's all this conflict for Paul. And so he gets kicked out of the synagogue and uh, decides to then meet next door. This is uh, made worse by the fact that Paul is successful in bringing some of the Jewish leadership of Corinth to believe in Jesus. And so now they're like, well, he just took out one of our synagogue rulers. What are we going to do? This guy is a real threat. And so it, it escalates and escalates, and it starts with this conflict. And his time there ends when they literally bring him into a judge, and they go, this guy needs to be punished for what he's doing. And the response there, um, I think sometimes is misunderstood in church. Gallio, the leader of the Roman people there, hardly gives him, like, a stamp of approval. Gallio doesn't go, well, Paul's a really great guy, and you should all listen to him. Paul actually starts to speak, and he's like, shut up. I don't even care what you have to say. This is nonsense. It's a bunch of religious garble that I don't care about, whatever. And then he kicks him out, and they beat somebody in front of the front door of his place, and he's like, whatever, I don't care. Like, this is completely um, non-concerned governments. This guy, if Paul was dead the next day, he wouldn't care. And so this is the world that Paul lives in. I also want to note, and I think it's helpful for this story, to realize that <laughs> these people are a mess. Uh, this is from the Bible Project. This is sort of their breakdown of some of the book of 1 Corinthians. If you've ever read 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul loves the Corinthians, but he doesn't like them very much. Okay, He is constantly fighting with them. He is constantly arguing with them. What's fascinating is despite all the harsh things we have, Paul says that he wrote a harsher letter that we lost, which is like, what was in that one, right? Because he's constantly upset with them. He's angry with the way they're acting. And they're doing weird stuff. People are marrying their stepmoms, and like, you know, there's like sexual issues going on in the church, and they're, they're uh, impressed with fancy speakers, but they think Paul is kind of Paul stinks because he's not as good of a speaker as they'd like him to be. They're um, getting drunk and sloppy at church on Sunday morning before the poor people can even get there to worship. So the poor people are hanging out with a bunch of guys, you know, like it's just an utter mess. And Paul is constant. Think about this. Paul is dealing with these people all throughout. I don't think he left and suddenly there were problems. I think knowing human beings, they were problems when Paul was there. So on the inside, he's got a bunch of knuckleheads that are doing bizarre stuff. 
He's got people on the outside that literally want to kill him. He's got a governing body that is completely disinterested in his health and safety. And that is life for Paul in Corinth. And the really fascinating part, uh, and in the midst of all this, he's also making tents. For a chunk of this time, at least, he is working uh, full-time and preaching on the weekends, so to speak. And I have no idea how Paul would have received that. Is that like a welcome respite or is that a frustration? You know, did he wake up, excuse me, wake up in the morning and start cutting fabric and putting it together and he's thinking to himself, you know, I could be doing a lot more for the Lord today if I wasn't doing this stupid job. I know a lot of ministers that are co- bivocational that feel that way, right? And so I just think it's a frustrating place. This is what I'm trying to say. Corinth is a frustrating time and place for Paul. And this bit in the middle I find really, really interesting. It's where I want us to focus most today. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. And so Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So many juicy little tidbits in this part. First of all, it tells us a lot about Paul. Um, I love Paul because maybe this is just me being me. I read Paul and I see a guy that's a little bit sarcastic, a guy that's not afraid to kind of mix it up, a guy that's not allowed to tell people to go castrate themselves if he's really angry with them, right? Like this is sort of the dude you got. Like he is, and, and so it's easy for me to see Paul as like, Teflon. Like, nothing bothers Paul. He is out there to go and rumble. If you want to come at me, I'll come at you. Let's go. Like, Paul, to me, is a tough guy. And unless Jesus is completely pastorally ignorant, which I don't think he is, what he says here is fascinating for the identity of Paul. Don't be afraid. Keep on preaching. That tells me that Paul was scared and tired Can you imagine Paul just being like, I'm done. This sucks. I get up every morning. I do a job that I hate so that I can go preach so people can literally try to chuck rocks at me. Like, what is the point? And when Jesus says, don't worry, I have many people in the city, I also assume that Paul's prayers were, why am I even here? Nobody listens. I've got about four people showing up to worship on Sunday. What is the point of this? And Jesus comes in and goes, Paul, I get it. I know you're tired. I know you're exhausted. I know you're afraid that you might die tomorrow. And I know that you feel like it's not getting anywhere. Just keep going. And it shows us a weakness of Paul that is refreshing if we think that doing God's work is about being like Superman, right? Second of all, it shows us something about Jesus, Um, I know scholars disagree about this, but Acts begins with this phrase, in my previous book, I told you all the things that Jesus began to do. And the point that preachers have always made, that I'll still stand by and the Greek guys can fight me about it, is that part of his point is that Jesus is going to continue to work through the book of Acts. And we've seen it, right? We have all these different scenes. Jesus appears to the, all the disciples and teaches them before he ascends up to heaven. Then Jesus, I think, is the Lord that Peter talks to, who's talking to him. He says, hey, don't call anything unclean, right? And puts all the food out on the blanket. Jesus is the one who is standing when Stephen is stoned to welcome him into heaven's embrace. Uh, Jesus is the one who says, Paul, Paul, why do you, per- Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus is an active character in the book of Acts. We do this thing where we know Jesus is raised, but we're like, yeah, he's raised, but he's kind of in heaven and unavailable. And that is not the way that Acts talks about Jesus. Acts talks about Jesus constantly interceding in the story and personally speaking to characters, personally moving in their lives. And so whatever Paul's got going on in this space, Jesus shows up and he goes, this guy needs a pep talk. Apparently, he's not in a good spot. Let me come in and personally intervene. And I always wonder what it was like. Like, is Paul just wandering around at night? And then all of a sudden, boom, I mean, it says a vision, right? Like, 
Is it another road to Damascus kind of thing? Is it something that happens in his dreams? Uh, like, I just, I don't know. How does Paul personally sp speak with Jesus for this message? There's also this fascinating point that I have many people still in Corinth. I'm guessing that Paul's response was, this Corinth? Are we talking about Corinth, Mississippi? Like, this place? Have you walked these streets? And God goes, oh, yeah, I got people all over the place. I got people coming out of the woodwork. They're like termites around here, people who follow me. And Paul's like, what? It tells us something really important about our spiritual vision. Our tendency is to consistently think that we are alone and there's nobody else around that thinks like us. Uh, I mean, like a stupid thing. A couple weeks ago, I talked about speaking at Brown at a campus ministry there. And, guys, this is dumb. I walked in, I don't know, I had 30, 40 college students, and I was like, whoa, there's like 30 or 40 Christians at Brown. <laughs> yeah, there's a few more than that, Caleb, you knucklehead. Right? But, like, there's sort of this, we get in this place where we're like, oh, it's, it, honestly, it's a little bit of a Messiah complex. It's a little bit of, like, pride. Oh, there is no one who cares about God like me left in the world. I am just the only one to carry the cross for Jesus. Thank God I'm here because there would be no one else to do this work unless I did it. And I think Paul even fell for that. And Jesus is like, listen, man, I've got some other stuff going on. You're not aware of it. That's okay. You don't need to know. Like, we'll get there. And our, our ability to miss those sort of things. But then the other really great little detail here is, and Paul stayed for a year and a half. 18 months. Day in, day out, work in the tents, being disliked, neighbors hate him, unsure if he's going to get attacked, all this kind of stuff. And he just slugs it out for 18 months. Here's where your Bible can deceive you a little bit. And it's not the Bible's fault. It's our fault for not understanding the Bible. All of these stories and all these towns are about half a chapter long, right? And so Lystra, it's one afternoon of preaching. Philippi is two or three weeks a month in Philippi. Athens is like 20 minutes of a speech, right? And they take up half a chapter. This is 18 months, and it takes up half a chapter. And when we're reading through it, we're like, well, ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. Stuff just happens so quick. And then we go out, and we try to live out our faith. We try to bring change in the world, and we go, geez, this seems to be taking longer than it took in the Bible because we just think it all happens in an afternoon. And this story is like, you know, sometimes you really got to slug it out for a little while. Sometimes you take some time. Sometimes it doesn't happen immediately, and you just keep working and working and working and working. And it can be deceptive in our Bibles the way that that time gets telescoped, right, into something really little. I try to imagine what that's like for Paul, just waking up every morning and just being like, all right, let's, let's go back at it, you know. And it shows the importance of patience. Uh, 18 months is interesting to me. I will tell you this. I've known a lot of church planners. Church planners come to town, we tend to find each other. I don't know, we have like a radar or something. And so I've known a lot of couples, a lot of men, women, have come to, the, to Providence to start a church. And in a lot of their denominations, they don't give them 18 months. They get six months to come in, meet people, start something, and have 100 people in worship, or else they're going to close the doors. And I have seen come in and go, dozens of them, never, ever get any start. And, frankly, their denominations would have shut us down a long time ago for not being big enough fast enough, right? I just don't think God always works that way. I'm not saying God can't work that way. But, like, that expectation that everything's going to happen in six months is bizarre. And I think this story is a great example of, like, no, Paul went 18 months. And, by the way, the church was a complete and utter mess when he was gone, right? As soon as he leaves, the thing falls into chaos, and he's got to write First and Second Corinthians to try to get him back on track. Um, because sometimes stuff is just messy and things are difficult. It sort of raises, I think, an interesting question for us of um, how long do you hold on 
And when do you give up? So this is a, a hard question. In this story, it's not like it gives us like a nice magical formula. But there are times in life where there are things we're trying to do for the Lord. There's things that we're hoping will happen. And the question is, how long do we do it and when do we give up? Bruce works with church plants. That's a question, right, of how long does this one keep functioning and when do they close their doors, right? How, how much lack of success is evidence that the Lord wants you to move on and how much is it that God just wants you to tough it out, right? But you know that in other things in your life. There's career things you try to do and you go, how long am I going to try to get this job that I can't seem to get hired for and when am I going to go, huh, that's not going to happen, Right? I mean, it's much more painful, but when people want to have children, how long do we keep trying without success before we look at adoption or we consider that maybe that's never going to happen? How, uh, how long does a church try an outreach that it seems like nobody cares about coming at before they go, oh, this is a waste of time. We should do something else, right? Like, how long do you keep going? And I guess the littlest thing that this story tells us is there's a few things that shouldn't be the reason we stop. Uh, we shouldn't stop just because we get tired. We shouldn't stop just because um, we feel like there's not enough n numbers or success out of it. We shouldn't stop because we're chicken. <laughs> we get fearful, right? These are all things that Jesus is telling Paul, do not stop. Do not let your fear take over. Do not let your exhaustion take over. Um, if it's harder, if we got to make the money work and make some tents to get things to work, that's not a reason for Paul to stop. Paul keeps going through that. Now, you know, there's times, I think, when God wants us to stop doing certain things. When God says, hey, I'm releasing you from worrying about that. But my experience, and I'll get in trouble because this is just Caleb thought, I see so many people, when I see them work in their life circumstances, they're like, well, I'm just really frustrated right now, so this can't be what God wants. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Lord is okay with your frustration from time to time, okay? That's my experience, is he's okay with you being frustrated. Or, man, it just doesn't feel like there's, this just doesn't feel fruitful enough. Yeah, talk to Jeremiah, man. There was a guy who cried. He is known as the prophet who's constantly crying because nothing worked the way it was supposed to. Like, there is this thing in Scripture of sticking it out when things get hard because God still has a lot of people that he's trying to reach through what you're doing. And you might not see it, but that's okay. Just keep moving. And I do think we're living in a world where it's like, well, this is causing me some emotional distress. Yeah, life's that way sometimes. Uh, you know, we know this when we have kids. If you want to never be emotionally distressed, do not become a parent, okay? It's like stopping being a parent because it's stressful is not an option. I mean, it is an option, but you'll go to jail, right? Like, <laughs> this is just not... You don't get to do that, right? Once you sign on for that ride, you're following it for 18 years. Like, that's the way it goes. Uh, and for Christians, this is the way marriage goes. You marry somebody, and you're with them until they drop dead to the best of your ability. That's why we do vows. That's why we commit ourselves. Because we say, for better or worse. And I think that we live in a time where we're so concerned about people's well-being, which I get, that it's like, oh, if it's feeling hard, just give up. And that is just not the godly way. Now, don't get me wrong. That's not meaning there's nothing that we ever have to give up. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody for, like, different situations. What I'm saying is there is something godly about I am going to grit my teeth and keep on going because God still is not finished with this story yet. And the key to this is when Paul gets down like this, it is the presence of Jesus that restores him. Paul does not suddenly open his Bible and go, well, the Bible says to have perseverance, therefore I'm okay. Right? Like, I don't think it's a head thing. I don't think Paul has some sort of information or teaching. It's not even a friendship thing. It's not like Timothy shows up and he goes, well, I was going to quit, but Timothy's here. I'm good now. What he needs is the presence of the risen Jesus in his life to look him in the eye and go, you're okay. You can do this. 
And this is where, as Christians, I mean, you guys know, I'm, I think about as heady as anybody that you're going to meet when it comes to your faith. But there is this point where you have to have some kind of personal, relational, emotional, some kind of connection to Jesus that is on some level other than just reading the Bible. So that Jesus can come in, move in your life, speak to your heart and say, you're going to be okay. Because you don't get through it any other way. I don't think Paul gets through it any other way. And it's just something that we have to have. But when we do that, it gives us the way to be faithful and to persevere, right? To keep on going, even when it's not fun. Even when it takes 18 months. Paul's going to go to Ephesus soon. He'll be from Ephesus for three years. Even someone like Paul that sort of got itchy and moved from place to place, there were times where he had to stick it out for the long haul. And um, it's something sometimes God calls us to. All right. Uh, let's do our core values. What questions do you guys have? Yes. Caleb, two uh, examples come to my mind of the perseverance aspect. The story of the people who built cathedrals back in the 13, 14, 1500s, where you would work on building a cathedral and you would never see it finished in your life, but you nonetheless believed that you were building this cathedral to God, and you realized that it would be beyond your lifespan. Uh, the other example that came to mind I think I had read somewhere that among Catholic missionaries at one point, their plan was at least 50 years in a place before they would give up. Uh, that's a long time. And it, you have to have a sense, I think, in faith of life beyond your own life, the transcendence that goes beyond just the time you have in this world. And I know I see it, son, when I think about you, when I think about uh, your grandfather, uh, Jonas, uh, and w I see then in the, in the kids that this m mission work that you've got here is transcends time, and it's not just one generation, it's multiple generations. Yeah, and I would add just like a little theological piece to that. That's why for Christians, being resurrection people is a big deal, because you will not see it in your lifetime, but there is a belief that you will see it someday. And it's why I'm big on like renewed heaven, renewed earth, instead of like going up to float in the sky. Because if you help build that cathedral, someday you'll get to worship in that cathedral in the new heaven and new earth, right? Because that work is not just, you know, the idea that God would then it, you know, like, oh, let's trash that when it's done. But no, there's sort of this idea that all of that work will still somehow be redeemed and valued. Anybody else questions? Yeah, Andrea. <coughs> so first is this, uh, uh, you know, comparison when you're speaking of how um, kind of like frustrated Paul is. Um, I immediately envisioned, I'm saying my age here, but like Rocky when he's like beaten down and like fighting the Russian and Mickey's in his corner saying like, you can't give up kid and you can see Rocky's face all bloody and pulpy and swollen. And you know, it's like he can barely stand up but he still manages, you know, with that theme music to fight his way back and win. Um, but so my question though is, is um, how do you battle that? Like as like say me for example, where you know there's like basically a lifelong situation that hasn't you know been good for myself or my family and it's kind of like you get frustrated and the waiting takes way too long the waiting is just not working out and um what do you do like in that yeah. situation so i mean i think the metaphor is good i think what's really interesting about rocky is rocky doesn't always win right, right. i forget which ones but i won't spoil them some of them Rocky doesn't win the fight, and he's still the hero of it when it's over because of the way he fought the fight, right? So that, I think that's a very, that's an apt Christian metaphor. Um, I think beyond that, um, 
this is always hard because Christians do not just love suffering. We're not just like masochists. But there is this Christian idea that there can be redemptive value to suffering. And in particular, the ability of suffering to create solidarity amongst people. Right? That like um, when you've had nothing but privilege and excess your whole life and everything's worked perfectly, you tend to treat people like trash. And when you've been treated like trash all your life, you tend to be kind to other people, right? There is something redemptive about that. And so I would say, in a circumstance that's frustrating and seems like it never ends and is going and going and going, it sounds hollow, and I don't mean for it to sound callous. There's a character building, though, that happens in that that's that's good. Um, This is part of my philosophy on why... um, Part of the reason we have four kids and they fuss about, like, we have to share rooms and there's not as much this or that around. Yeah, I know, your life's harder, and we did that on purpose because it's going to help you learn how to share and, like, be good friends and to deal with other people, right? Like, ha- having to share a s- – <laughs> Fran feels strongly about this. Share a room with your sister, good. It will be suffering that will force you to be a better human being, right? And – um, and I just think, you know, maybe God isn't quite that harsh on it, but, like, there is kind of this idea that we do grow and learn by those things. Um, I don't know. I think we can find value in them. Paul talks about, interestingly enough, in Second Corinthians, the whole thorn in the flesh thing, where he's like, I have this thing. He calls it a thorn in the flesh. None of us know what it is. Sometimes I wonder if it's the Corinthian church themselves, <laughs> where Paul's like, if I just, if God would just get rid of it, I'd feel so much better. And God's like, no, because you're experiencing my strength and your weakness that you'd never experience if you could just fix it yourself. And there is a Christian principle there that sometimes we're afflicted with things that only God can fix so that we learn to trust God. Yeah. Oh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, and just in retort to you, like, I do feel like – I am a very strong and resourceful person because of all the stuff I've gone through ever since I can, I think I was seven. And um, I think Addison is a super, like, respectful and um, amazing young person because, like, she has to go, she's had to go through some stuff. She's had to fight for where she's at. She's had to apply for things to get, you know, in certain places. And, um, it does make us stronger, but it just, it still sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say, the, I think the flip side of that is that some certain issues are human-created issues. <laughs> it's not God that's stopping it. It's people doing wrong things. And so I think sometimes suffering can be character character building in the sense of things boil to a point where it moves people to stand up and say something and do something. Um, And I kind of think of that as like, if you think about like the Israelites in Egypt, they lived there 400 years and it kind of, the way the story is told, it breaches a boiling point where it's like enough is enough and God delivers them but also, like, the people have to be moved to a point of, like, we're, this isn't going to happen anymore. Yeah. What's fascinating to me, though, is that that, m- in my experience, does not invalidate the redemptiveness of the suffering. Even if the suffering is pointless and human-caused, God is still capable to create something redemptive out of it, which is fascinating, right? Like. Yeah, yeah. I think, but I guess what I'm saying is I wonder if sometimes, and I want to be careful with this because it can sound like, you're not sensitive to people suffering, but that sometimes if he allows certain situations to happen because he expects expects us to stand up and do something (laughs) about it rather than just watch it happen. Yeah. Any other questions? Caleb, is it 1 Corinthians where Paul says something to the effect of God works through all things to bring about good in the world? First Corinthians, trying to remember eight. Um, I think you're talking about Romans. Romans, Romans eight. perhaps. Okay. Yep.
Caleb, that's not fair. You may take it from me. I think with me it is that um, giving up is is uh, probably all, a lot of us so much easier than to keep going. But with my personal feeling and my feelings that um, <coughs> excuse me that I believe in trusting the Lord so much that um, the reason I'm giving up is not an option because. When this life is over, I believe that the people that I truly love, that God promised, I'll see them again. So therefore, if I give up and, and think that that's it, this is it, this is all we have. I mean, look at this world. Is really this all we have? I <laughs> just believe that <coughs> this is all that God's given us. So, and there are so many people that I love deeply that have already left, and there are so many people that I can I love still here, and I sure hope I can see them all again one day. So, that's the reason I don't give up. Thanks, Betty. I was just curious if you had looked at the role of Paul's co-workers in these kinds of things. Uh, just as I've been reading through Acts, I think I noted the 19. I know it's coming up, but there's a case where like seven different people are identified in like that chapter and a half of, as co-workers. We know in the first part of this chapter, he's actually living in the house of Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth. And I, what I find maybe one of the st distinctive factors between uh, suffering in torment and suffering with character and purpose is the people that you're doing it with. Where when we're, s oftentimes when we're suffering mean meaninglessly, there's a great sense of isolation. No one understands me. But when you're suffering with others, like, as you said earlier, the purpose starts to focus in. No, I mean, it's certainly, there's no doubt that this whole section of Acts sets up Priscilla and Aquila as like these really important, influential, key figures in these places. That, you know, they're just, um, I, you know, I think it shows, this is maybe just me editorializing, the people that, you know, a lot of times we think about the leader, the preacher, the whoever, it's that next step down, those people that are supporting and keeping those people up that really make the difference. You know, when we look at organizations that burn out and have terrible situations, they're really top heavy. There's a big guy, there's a guy in charge who does everything, but then there's no support or accountability around them. And it's not what we see modeled by Paul, right? You see all these other folks that are around and playing a role. I mean, Romans 16 is the greatest example of that. It's a whole chapter of just name after name after name after name of people, you know. Anything else? All right. Let's do our prayer time. I think Gianna is going to do our prayers for us. Good morning. Good morning. Um, who has prayer request? I know I do. My daughter, Annie, is home. I highly suspect she has the flu. Um, she feels pretty yucky. I know there's a lot of yuckies going around, so Andy. Anybody else?
Yes, Anna. Can you remind me of their name? And Brittany is the one said. Yes, Liz. Amen. Subs always get the worst. Very good, Liz. That's awesome. Who else? clarification. I know Donna has a new granddaughter. And she was pretty excited about that. hard. Yeah. Hard to say goodbye. Especially hard to say goodbye really slow. What is her name? Sandy. Aunt Sandy. his name? Durin. Durin. Having trouble seeing. Hmm. Okay. Bruce? Yes. Brendan Vincenzo, we love you up in Maine. He just moved on Friday up to Maine, starting a new job tomorrow. And um, it's all new and exciting, but probably scary, too. I don't know. So pray for him as he adjusts to new places and new people. And as they adjust to him. <laughs> okay. Pray with me. Father in heaven, you already know all these things. You already know our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you anytime. We can talk to you anytime and know that you're listening. 
Thank you that you answer. Thank you that you hear us. We have so many people we know that are sick. We pray for Annie and Andy's mom. We pray for Brittany. And pray for Duran. And we pray for Leon's mom, too. Um, and especially Aunt Sandy, who may be coming to see you. So many people in so many stages of health. We pray that you heal them. Because we know you can. And if you choose not to, we pray you help us to get through. Lord, I pray for Lizzie's substitute teacher. Subs get the worst treatment from the kids. Father, help the kids in her class to change their vision, change their viewpoint of this man who's a good teacher. Father, help us to seek you this week. Help us not to be discouraged. Help us to press on. You've given every one of us jobs to do. And they get hard and they get tiresome and they get boring maybe. Help us to press on knowing that you'll let us know when we need to switch gears. And that you promise you're with us every day. Help us to trust you and rely on you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me encourage you, as always, uh, if you didn't get an order of worship, you probably did because Gabe's doing a really good job handing them out. Um, but make sure you um, take this, take it home, put it on your bulletin board. If you need to put a picture of it on your phone, whatever, there is... 88% of the questions I am asked are on this piece of paper right here. And so we are, uh, things we got coming up, feast groups, men's group is going to be on Thursday at the Borchers at 7 o'clock. Um, I don't know totally what we're doing yet, but I'm getting some ideas. I think it'll be fun. So come, we'll probably have a little something to munch on, uh, and we'll talk, have some good conversation, and enjoy each other. I've heard the ladies' uh, women's night the last this week went really well, and they had a good bunch there, and so I'm really glad... Uh, feels like people are responding some to the mixing things up a little bit, so I'm, I'm glad that's working well. Um, Easter. Easter is coming three weeks from today, and so um, she is not here today, but talk to Carolyn about if you want to help bring some food for um, brunch. She is coordinating that as usual, so we'll have a big brunch for everybody. Uh, also, we'll have an Easter egg hunt. Joe is amazing. He's already on that, so that'll be good. Uh, think about inviting some friends. If you have friends that have kiddos, it's a fun thing to come to. Um, you know, we're really chill. So if they come and they pick Easter eggs and they eat brunch and then we start doing Jesus stuff and they walk out the door, we're not going to tackle them. Like, we would like them to stay, but, like, you know, that's their choice. And so whatever people feel comfortable coming to, we love for them to be here. And it's just our time to be hospitable that way. So invite your friends. Pack the place out. It, it's always a good, fun day. All right, uh, generosity, I'm just going to go ahead and pass our baskets. If you'd like to give something today, that would be excellent. Appreciate it. Mm. All right, trajectory. Um, some of the moments with Jesus we talked about today cannot be manufactured, but it's probably a worthwhile exercise if Jesus were to talk to you and to say, don't be afraid, don't give up, I'm still working on this, consider this week, what would he say that to you about? Because there's a decent chance that he's trying to say it if you'd listen. And so take a moment to just consider, what might Jesus say to me this week? Don't be afraid, don't give up. I'm working on it. That, I think, would be helpful for us all. All right. I think, uh, Preston, one more song. Is that right? 
and uh, then we'll be done. Let's go and stand for our final song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. Different one. <laughs> my hope is built on nothing less. Now it's in my head. Let's just do that one. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. We'll go with that. We'll go with the spirit of, of going into that. Let me leave you with this uh, blessing this morning, the poem prayer, uh, that kind of connects with that tra uh, trajectory that we just had. May this day bring Sabbath rest to my heart and my home. May God's image in me be restored and my imagination in God be restoried. May the gravity of material things be lightened and the relativity of time slow down. May I know grace to embrace my own finite smallness in the arms of God's infinite greatness. May God's word feed me and the spirit lead me into the week and into the life to come. May God be with you as you go from this place. God be with you.